Okay. Uh, so the topic of the talk today is specifically focusing on the diagnosis of latent and active TB. Uh, we'll walk through some of the, the evidence that we have supporting what we do currently. So to go through, we're going to start with just basic background on the bacteria, um, go through some epidemiology, transmission, diagnostics, and then at the end talk about the current guidelines. So we're going to start kind of at the basics about the bacteria. Uh, it's rod shaped, two to four microns in length. Uh, its main phenotypic characteristic is the fact that it's acid fastness, meaning that it re resists decolorization uh, with acid and alcohol. Um, it's primarily intracellular. It's an obligate aerobe, although uniquely it is able to survive in low oxygen tension states. Uh, in the presence of an normal, in a normal immune response, uh, it induces this granulomatous reaction. So here in the first two, in figures A and B, we just have uh, sputum smears uh, showing the acid fast bacilli, and then we have the fluorochrome stain in figure C. So the clinical infection, tuberculosis, can be caused by any of the following. Um, we have uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium bovis, and mycobacterium africanum. Uh, Mycobacterium bovis is the strain that the BCG vaccine was based off of, and uh, Mycobacterium africanum is, is only found in, a, in a, a small location in Africa and in patients that come from there. Uh, and what they know from research is that this bacteria has over 4,000 protein coding genes, and because of this, its genetic makeup really gives it the potential to survive in a lot of different environments. So looking at the epidemiology, the World Health Organization uh, most recently, and the most recent data that I could find was from 2012, and they estimate that about a third of the population, so about 1.9 billion people, are infected with active or latent TB. And in 2012 alone, there were 8.6 million new cases. So the total prevalence of active cases in the world uh, is about 12 million, resulting in 1.2 million deaths per year. Um, however, the rate's on decline at this point, about 2% per year overall, but varying drastically depending on the region that you're in. So looking specifically in areas like the U.S. that are classified as high-income, low-incidence countries. So since the beginning of the 20th century, uh, TB rates have steadily decreased. Uh, in the 1940s, and you'll see on the graph on the next page, um, starting with the anti-tuberculosis chemotherapy, we had about a 5% decline per year. Um, uniquely except between the, the mid to early 90s and uh, mid 80s. And there was a slight increase at that time. So here you can see it on the graph as well. The slight increase was thought to be due to a couple of different factors. Uh, there was um, an HIV epidemic. There was an increase in um, immigration from areas that had higher incidence of TB. Uh, but since that time, it's been declining since. So looking at the transmission, I'm sure this is a review, but we're going to go through because it plays a role in why diagnostics are difficult. So very basically, you have a source patient who's infected, um, and depending on many factors, it plays a role in how infectious that patient is. So doing things like singing, coughing, talking closely in the same room, they transmit particles um, that are actually humidified or in water that dehyde when they are in the air, uh, actually evaporate. So the bacterium can stay in the air for about four hours. Um, and then if you're in the proximity and the conditions are right and you are susceptible, uh, the bacteria can actually go all the way to the alveoli. The bigger particles are less infectious because they can be cleared. So like I said, it's, it's, uh, transmission is influenced by many features based on bacillary load of the source patient. Um, solid nodules are thought to contain about 10,000 TB bacteria whereas cavitary lesions are like upwards of 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 12th bacteria. Um, so the closeness, you have to be in relative proximity of the, other, of the source patient. And then looking at the condition in the environmental air, is it a negative pressure room in the hospital versus in a closed bedroom in a small home? Um, and the ability to which the mycobacteria, or to which the bacteria can establish itself within the lung. Uh, so then we have the factors, like I said again, uh, coughing versus sneezing. I don't have statistics on which ones are more infectious. Um, but the use of chemotherapy, interestingly, so when patients are started on treatment, we consider them to be less infectious. 
which is true from the studies that I found, but they, they actually are still infectious and they have some population studies. One I found in San Francisco, they actually were able to trace about 17% of patients with treated, currently being treated TB with negative smears still infected other people. Um, the same was found in animal studies prior to that. So once you have, uh, once you've been in contact with TB, this disease, uh, basically what happens is you inhale it, it goes to the distal part of the airways, uh, upper, the aerated lung zones, lower part of the upper lobes, upper part of the lower lobes. And you get this inflammatory reaction, which is really the premise for um, the diagnostics that we have. So you get macrophages and dendritic cells that go there and they basically wall off the bacteria and what we know is a granuloma. So this granuloma can calcify and form what you see here in the, in the cartoon uh, gone complex. And then here on chest x-ray in, in an asymptomatic patient um, under a latent TB case, this is what uh, it could look at, it could look like. Um, however, it's important to note that the same chest x-ray can be actually found in a person with active TB. So it's really based on symptomatology. So here, looking kind of quickly, I know it's busy. Um, once, you have, once you have exposure and you get this primary focus, you can have primary progressive TB and it can spread through the lymphatics, through the blood to form either uh, pulmonary TB or even miliary TB. Um, alternatively, it can stay walled off which means not, not able, for self, not able to recognize it. So you have no antigenic response. And it can remain latent for years. Um, at any point, though, depending on host factors, um, immunosuppression, medications, uh, it can then reactivate. So here, uh, really, the only part that's, that's actually important, this is basically looking at a schematic of our immune system and you have tumoral and cellular immunity. And the basis for TB, um, both the reaction within the granuloma and as well as within the diagnostic test for, for diagnosis, it's really this T cell, the cellular immunity, this T cell response. And it's really the release of interfering gamma that causes the reaction. So there's not real clear guidelines, specifically in diagnosing latent and active TB as far as and we'll walk through sort of different methods that we have and why one is used versus another. But in 2017, the ATS, CDC, and IDSA task force, really what they did is they looked at the relevant evidence that we have, and they wanted to use that for the basis of recommendations. So they were able to come up with 23 recommendations um, for pediatric all the way through adult for diagnosing uh, latent and active pulmonary and also extra pulmonary TB. So six of the recommendations were considered strong, uh, 17 were considered conditional. And throughout the, through the article, throughout the um, results, it was stated you know, repeatedly, these are not intended necessarily for standard of care. Rather, it's the best evidence we have based on the research there to make sort of a clinical decision, but in no way can it account for every clinical scenario. So this is just to give the basis of what really strong versus a weak recommendation is. And you know, looking at what clinicians would look at that is that most individuals should receive this intervention. It's what we would probably use clinically as a guideline. Um, but under policymakers, that it's still it's more likely to be adapted as a policy in most situations, whereas the weak, there's still a lot of debate about why one uh, one choice is superior to another. So now we'll talk about the diagnosis of latent TB. So we kind of said that, you know, infection does not necessarily equal, um, does not necessarily follow exposure. But when it does resolve, again, it's that cell-mediated immune response that is obtained. And these patients are asymptomatic. Once they develop signs and symptoms of disease, they're no longer latent, so it's a different track or a different algorithm. Um, and the reason that diagnosing these patients is so important is because it's the leading cause of infectious disease morbidity and mortality worldwide. Yet there's still a lot of issues with the diagnosis of this. So again, why is treating TB important? And here we just have a, a graph basically showing what, what we would need to do to reach a target of less than 10 cases per million under various treatment scenarios. So assuming if you 
you would reach the pre-elimination target by 2025 if you quadrupled all of the treatment for latent TB by 2008. Um, so really what they're showing is that there is a benefit to treating these patients. So the goal is to, when you're testing for latent TB, is to not only identify patients who possibly have TB, but also risk stratify them, and we'll walk through that, but also looking at patients who benefit from prophylactic therapy. Um, you know, patients that are 85 years old that have metastatic cancer may not be the patient population that's going to benefit, especially if their documented exposure was from 60 years prior. Um, the highest risk of conversion from latent to active TB is within the first two years of exposure. So really looking at the time course and trying to figure out what their actual exposure was in relation to their current situation is important. And then on top of that, the likelihood of completing treatment, depending on which, which resource I looked at, is about 17 to 37% of those that test positive and are eligible for treatment. So the, everyone's aware this is a PPD, the tuberculin skin test. So this reaction was first described in the 1890s. And what they did is they basically precipitated nonspecific molecules from the bacteria, and at the time, they actually thought they were creating a cure for TB. Uh, but when injected, it causes um, a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. That initial, uh, this initial uh, protein derivative was very nonspecific, though. So then in the 1930s, we had this more purified protein preparation, which is now known as the PPD. Um, so what it takes is the most prevalent antigenic proteins these happen to be these bacterial heat shock proteins. So what they did now, so looking at specifically how the test is done, you take um, a very small amount, one cc of, it's a standardized unit, five tuberculin units of this protein. You inject it into the volar surface or any surface, um, and you make sure you have to get to subcutaneous tissue, and you watch it 48 hours, and then you read it afterwards and reading it is basically looking at the, the amount of induration or edema that's created, um, not looking at the redness or, or surrounding um, irritation. So this is a chart um, that I think we've all seen and how these are read. So in normal persons with no risk factors for TB, you need to have greater than 15 millimeters of induration, um, greater than 10 if there's recent arrival from a high prevalence area, if they're IV drug users, um, residents or employees of high congregate settings, hospitals, jails, um, mycobacterial lab personnel, um, and then children and infants, um, I'm sorry, children less than five, and then anyone um, exposed to someone in a high-risk category. And then greater than five is for basically those patients that would not mount a good immune response. So HIV patients, um, recent contacts of persons with TB, uh, patients with fibrotic changes on chest X-ray, we know that fibrotic changes are the most, uh, they're the mo patients most likely to progress to active TB. And then immunosuppressed patients, so for equivalence, it's about 15 milligrams a day of prednisone for a month or anyone taking a TNF alpha inhibitor. So the sensitivity and specificity of this test, so for baseline, patients that we know were previously treated for TB, the sensitivity is very high, 95 to 98% which is what we'd expect. They were previously exposed, we know this, and they have a very high sensitivity. In patients that have any sort of process that interferes with their cell-mediated immune response, things like HIV, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, any um, corticosteroids or immunosuppressive therapy, the sensitivity drops significantly down to about 80%. Uh, again, the specificity is high, but because of the protein that is used in the cross-reactivity, um, those with the prior BCG vaccination or those living in areas where there's a high prevalence of non-tuberculous mycobacteria, the specificity decreases significantly um, and you have a lot more false positives. So the next step from the tuberculin skin test is the two-step PPD, which is what most, I think most of us get here. And really the, the point of the, of the two-step is to avoid um, a boosted reaction with an actual conversion. Really what they mean, and there's a nice algorithm um, to walk through it, is if your first, uh, your first TB test is positive, you're classified as having been exposed. You probably have a TB infection. 
um, pending the other clinical scenarios like the BCG vaccine or um, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. If it's negative, uh, you retest one to three weeks later. If it stays negative, you probably don't have latent TB. If it's positive, it's considered a boosted reaction. So really what they're trying to capture are patients that were infected with TB many, many years ago or lost their ability to mount a response. So then you can boost it with the second, um, with the second test. So the benefits of TST um, testing, uh, it's simple, it's low cost to patients. Uh, on average, it's three to $10. Uh, you don't need phlebotomy. Um, it reflects your uh, body's uh, immune response. And there's a lot of well-controlled studies out there that actually support the use of, of PPD to then detect latent TB and then also to guide therapy. So they were able to show that it truly does make a difference. And there's well-established guidelines for what, can, what is uh, TST conversion. <coughs> Limitations though, you need trained personnel to administer and interpret the test. There's a lot of variability, both inter and intra-reader. Um, you need patients to come back is one of the biggest limiting factors. If they're not in the hospital and they're not mandated to have this done, they have to return within 48 hours to have the test read. Uh, you can have false positive results, as I said, because you have cross-reactivity with um, both BCG and NTM. And then you can have false negative results if patients are immunosuppressed. Um, and then for completeness, there are rare adverse effects. The most common is ulceration at the site of the PPD injection. Um, and then the interpretation is, it can be complicated. So you have the boosting phenomenon, which I mentioned. Um, looking at the timeline of when a patient's converted, when they went from possibly having a negative uh, skin test to a positive skin test, may influence your decision whether or not to treat these patients. Like I said before, the highest risk are, are patients that have converted, and then within the next two years, the highest risk of converting to active TB is in that time period. The overall lifetime risk factor of somebody that has latent TB of then converting to active is about 4 to 5%. Um, patients can also have a reverted reaction, basically reversions, and basically those are patients that are just unable to mount an immune response for whatever reason. It also, they've also been able to show that in a subset of patients that did have an exposure, did receive prophylactic therapy, they can then actually have a negative PPD afterwards. Uh, the tests was, were done in healthy individuals, and they don't have any long-term effects on their interfering gamma titers or things like that to actually justify why some people phenotypically don't seem to become infected with TB, uh, or at least persist with a latent infection. So now we have a newer test, um, the interfering gamma release assay. And this is still a reflection of your cellular, cellular immune response. But what they've done is they've discovered antigens that are even more specific. So it's, for this test, they actually found uh, proteins on the RD1 gene segment, which isn't important except in the sense that it's only found, it's not in the BCG vaccine strain. It's only in wild type uh, Mycobacterium bovis and in um, a couple other strains, Mycobacterium kinsasii um, and Mycobacterium marinum. So it eliminates a lot of the cross-reactivity with alternative strains that don't cause tuberculosis. In the U.S., we have two tests that are currently approved um, and a third one that I think was just recently approved this year. So we have the Quantiferin TB Gold test and the T-spot test. So very quickly, just to look at what the test actually does. Uh, so it's an in vitro test. Uh, this is the quantiferin gold intube test, and what you do is you take about three cc's of blood, and you have a positive and negative control here, and you basically spin the blood with the negative positive control and then with the proteins that are specific to TB. You spin it, and then you look at the, you do an ELISA assay basically to figure out how much interferon gamma was released in response to the positive, negative, and then to the uh, antigens from the bacteria. So the negative control controls, first of all, to, for low levels of interferon gamma expressed, and then the high is to ensure patients can actually mount an immune response. Um, and what you need to do is you do the ELISA, and if you are 25% higher than your negative control, you're considered to be positive. Um, whereas in the T-spot test, it's very similar. Instead of using um, tubes, you're basically using plates, and the plates are coated uh, with interferon gamma antibodies. 
and you plate the same, the negative control and the positive, as well as with the two antigenic proteins. You place your uh, peripheral blood cells over it. You let them sit there and incubate for about 36 hours, wash them away, and then tag them. In this test, you're basically counting spots. So the spots here are positives. So anything more than eight spots is considered positive. Anything five to seven is intermediate, and you need to take in clinical context with whatever the patient's risk factors are in their clinical presentation. And then anything less than four is negative. So the benefits here is that it's more specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, it can be performed in a single visit, um, and it's, it's a little bit more um, controlled in the laboratory sense. There's specific protocol, there's less, inter, there's less reader variability. The cost here, um, our limitation, uh, it, when, it varies widely when I look it up, but to a patient it costs about $40 for an, one of the IGRA tests to be done. Um, you need to have blood draw, and the, the interpretation still isn't crystal clear. So at the end of the day, the goal is to, uh, to identify patients that you think could have latent TB and also would benefit from therapy. And there's no randomized trials that I was able to find that compares different diagnostic approaches and measured clinical outcomes. So really, you want to look at the accuracy of the test within the patient's um, risk factors. So this graph basically explains it. So well, this is a test, this is a graph basically showing you the likelihood of being infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis on the left, and the highest risks are household contacts that have recent exposures of someone with an active case, um, and then going down uh, residents, and then or residents or employees of high risk congregate settings to no risk factors. And then the risk of developing uh, TB if infected, so you have low risk is somebody with no risk factors, Intermediate are patients with clinical predisposition. They have chronic, um, chronic problems, immunosuppression, um, IV drug users. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant um, like diabetes uh, and chronic renal failure. And then the high risk are patients that have HIV, uh, young children, or immunosuppressive therapy. So based on this graph, it may make a difference in which test you choose to order for a patient. So. Overall, the guidelines that I mentioned in the beginning, they recommend performing the IGRA over a TST in individuals greater than five who meet any of the following criteria. So they're likely to be infected. They have a low or intermediate risk of disease progression if they're infected. And in patients that you decide for whatever reason that latent TB testing is warranted and those that have a history of BCB, BCG vaccination or unlikely to return for reading. But again, when I walked through all the recommendations, if you have the option and you have the affordability, they say an IGRA is, is superior. Um, some for the reasons that patients don't need to return, there's less reader variability. But if that's not possible and you still think testing is warranted, you should still do the PPD test. So looking at diagnosis of active pulmonary TB. Uh, so again, patients have to be exposed in a similar way as before. Uh, the most uh, specific symptoms that I can find for active TB, a cough greater than two to three weeks of duration, uh, they have to have lymphadenopathy, fevers, night sweats, and weight loss, in addition to a relevant epidemiologic risk factor. So someone that has prior history of TB infection or disease, somebody that has a known or a possible exposure, or someone that has had a residence or travel to an endemic area. So the same chest x-ray I showed you before could represent a patient with active TB, which is really the important, the reason I put it up twice. Um, here I think we see the more classic presentation of active TB with a nice cavitary lesion over here. So when we look at diagnosing um, active TB, we're not going to talk about all of these. Um, the first three are really for diagnostics. So we all know we have, um, we get our three AFBs, you get sputum, you get microscopy. You get growth detection, that's your culture, it takes six to eight weeks to get back. And then we have this nucleic acid amplification test, which comes back in a day. So the, the tests below that are really to help determine how resistant the bacteria are, um, susceptibilities to different treatments, but not for diagnostics. So looking forward, so the one that we'll talk about a little bit separate is this nucleic acid test, which is not, not always done. 
uh, but was recently established that should be done. So it has a greater positive, basically what it is, is, it, is an RNA probe that you can PCR um, bacteria genes from. So in patients that have AFB smear positive specimens, where non-tuberculous mycobacterium is also prevalent, using, adding this test to it can really help delineate whether treatment is warranted or not. So what they're trying to do is find a, a quicker way to ensure that those that are positive are of higher likelihood of being true tuberculosis infection. And it, the idea is also that it will help with infection control. Are we isolating patients that really need to be isolated? Are we starting treatment on patients sooner if we don't have to wait the six to eight weeks for the cultures to grow? So again, it's based on symptoms um, for active TB and it leads to therapy that improves outcomes and disease transmission. So both from a personal patient care standpoint and then from a public health standpoint. So performing three AFB smears is sort of our go-to starting point when we think that a patient has a chance of having TB. So what I wanted to show here is that the sensitivity is about 70%. So the first specimen is 53, it goes up to 64 with two and then 69 with three. Um, there are some studies that suggest that getting an early morning specimen is a better use of but higher sensitivity. Uh, the specificity is pretty high, uh, but depending on, like again, the prevalence of having non-tuberculosis mycobacterium present, it can actually have a high negative predictive value or high false positive rate, sorry. So we want to talk about, you know, should we get a sputum? Do we do Bronx? on these patients, and there were six studies that were found that really compared the diagnostic yield and then the safety aspects of both. Uh, five out of six of the studies basically found higher yield from induced sputum than bronchoscopy. Uh, one showed similar results. So basically, if you can get patients to expectorate sputum, it's safer and you have the same opportunity to get results as you do with bronch. And then sort of walking through, if you can't induce a sputum, should you then go for a bronchoscopy? And it, it depends on your suspicion that someone has TB. Um, but it does have, it does appear the, the diagnostic yield varies a lot from, from study to study. But anywhere from 50 to 100 percent um, doesn't seem to be affected by HIV infections. And they found that bronchial washings had the same yield as a BAL, um, but higher frequency of positive AFBs. So if you can't get a respiratory sam sample and you still have high clinical suspicion, then doing flexible bronchoscopy, BAL, is, is appropriate. Um, and then this is just sort of to reiterate that those samples that you get are worth sending. Um, the diagnostic yield, again, varies greatly, but they do recommend in the guidelines that post bronx sputum specimens should be collected. You should perform AFB smears on them. You should perform cultures as well, and at least one should be sent for the nucleic acid amplification test. So the last thing we'll talk about today is the diagnosis of tuberculous pleural effusion. Um, so classically, it's a small to moderate sized effusion. Often it's loculated. Um, it can have some associated pleural thickening with it. Uh, but the, the question is, is, is a diagnostic approach any different here? And let me go here. So again, the definitive way for diagnosis is uh, culture positive. But there's some, sometimes we have questions of whether or not, one, this patient does need a thoracentesis for diagnosis, and there's really two reasons that this needs to be done. And the first is that you have a patient that you suspect TB on, but their sputums have been negative. So it's appropriate to go after the pleural fluid for another alternative way to make a diagnosis. The other time that performing a thoracentesis is uh, appropriate is if you have a patient with established pulmonary TB, and they now have a pleural effusion, but there's, they have risk factors for alternative things such as malignancy. So then again, getting cytology and ruling out um, TB from the pleural space is, is again appropriate. So the issue here is that, again, the cultures take six to eight weeks. We don't really have a sh easy way to diagnose TB this way. And the nucleic acid amplification has only been approved for sputum. It's not been approved for any other bodily fluids, including CSF and pleural fluid. So we have um, indicators that make it more or less likely that TB is in the pleural space. So lower pH, some studies cite less than 7.4, some go down much lower than that. Um, having a high lymphocytic to neutrophil ratio higher than 0.75, having an ADA greater than 40, and having low glucose. 
if the two in bold are not present, it has a very high negative predictive value of it not being TB. Um, but again, it really based on clinical risk factors. There's about 20% of patients that are misdiagnosed not having TB, and they actually do. The, the issue is, is sometimes there's a high false, they miss a lot of the cultures basically, both plural and um, plural effusions. So if, if the clinical suspicion is still there despite having negative cultures, the recommendation is still to treat. So in summary, TB is the leading cause of infectious disease morbidity and mortality worldwide. Um, the IGRA is the preferred test at this point for latent TB diagnosis. The gold standard for pulmonary TB is, is positive culture. Um, but using the smear microscopy with the nucleic acid amplification allows for earlier treatment strategies and better pu public health um, screening. Are there any questions? I don't, I don't have. Absence. Yeah, like presence makes it less likely to be Yeah. Does anybody know why that? I don't. I was told in my youth that it was due to the fact that the tuberculosis is COVID the mining of the of the lung of the floor space and the medial cells could not fall into the floor. That's made sense to me, but that, that's I'm not sure if it's true. I didn't check it out. This that's just what I was told about. Something. Yeah. So if you do, so kind of looking off of that, if you do your three AFBs and they come back negative, you're still stuck because you had a high clinical suspicion that somebody has TB, but nothing really to go off of. If you do the nucleic acid amplification and it's positive, it can still pick up basically bacteria that weren't seen under a microscope. It can still pick up the RNA. So if one's positive, it doesn't really help you much, but if two are positive, they say it's a clinical indication to treat at that point. Similarly, if you have somebody that has three out of three positive AFBs, but you're still not sure, their symptoms are sort of somewhere in between, you can also do this to help rule out TB because it's specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis. So if they have Kinsasii or a different strain, it will be negative. So you can use that to guide to not treat. Used alone, though, it's not it's not an indication. It has to be used in conjunction with sputum smears and also a culture. I think one of the mistakes that I see people making, especially more junior physicians who who have less who have less experience, is that um, the test, whichever test you want to talk about, the test is ordered without the thought being given ahead of time as to what you're going to do with the test. And I think it's really important maybe always important with everything we do, but with this particular thing, this particular group of problems, I think thinking through the algorithm beforehand and knowing what that test result is going to do and how it's going to make, what your decision is going to be based on the test is important. For example, you had one slide, I think, where if you did a boosted TB test, then when you did the second test, then you would have to think about what to do next. So down there at the bottom right follow up, positive and evaluate treatment, or the box right above that says the person does have late TB, a decision must be made. That decision should have been made before you ever mm -hmm. started down the algorithm, I think. And so, because there are, there are times when you, based on a clinical setting, you would avoid the testing and simply go straight to treatment, for example, if you thought the person had TB or something like that. So you, you really should be thinking about what your algorithm is and how the test is going to change what you're going to do before you ever embark down that. And I think that's important. Okay. I guess the um, on a test would avoid the whole boosting. Um, yeah, so the one thing that I body of you one thing that I wonder about, and I don't know about this in general, but I looked it up looked it up once specifically for HIV and Paul you and I talked about this was that there were 
there, there was one study that I came across where they had done both in HIV patients. They had done both skin testing and, and the chronic urine uh, testing and compared the two. And there were a certain number of patients, small number, but definitely a significant number of patients who were negative on one and positive on the other and vice versa. So the tests are not perfectly concordant and it's not clear when that concordance doesn't exist, what that means. And so um, the comment about the boosting thing versus the quantum parent, you know, I'm not sure what that all means. And, and I'm not sure how well that's been studied. Maybe you came across that. So it, it, I couldn't find a clear like number in which patient population is better. I was, the reading that I had done in patients that do have like HIV or an immune suppressed state, basically really a T cell problem. Um, this, the IGRAs are better, but there's still that false negative chance. Yeah, there so also can be, if you do a PPD, oftentimes I've seen here, they order a PPD and a quantiferin. If you do a PPD even 12 hours before an IGRA, it can be falsely positive. So there's that issue as well. That's a good thing to know. Mm -hmm. I, I specifically was looking for that question in HIV patients, and the article was that I found in terms of numbers, it, and it was four or five years ago, so maybe there's more recent data, but the numbers were relatively robust, I want to say around 1,000 patients, and there was the rate of false negative tests was similar each test, but the groups were not the same, so that um, you could be falsely negative for one or the other, but you might be positive for the other. So, so I wonder if in an immunocompromised population doing both tests may be warranted, I don't know. Well, interestingly, and I don't think it's really become more prevalent, they did, the FDA just approved a, like a third generation IGRA. And in that third generation IGRA, they're capturing the amount of CD8 cells present to the ratio of CD4 cells. So I don't think immediately it's going to be of much use, but I think from a research standpoint, looking down the line in patients that may have HIV, it may help shed light on why that why that is, and may kind of help guide which tests you then do. In your preparation for this conference, did you have to come across any articles where there are certain X-ray findings that puts it at higher risk for being tuberculosis versus some other disease? After I finished it, Dr. Bowles, there, fibrotic disease is, is the highest risk of progression from latent to active. I, I didn't... Oh, just TB in general. Oh, so... I have, for, I have a reason I made that. Sure. Um, I think what I found was just the basics of what I put out. There's a lot of findings. Some of them are less descript, but classically you have a cavitary lesion. Um, you can have just some lymphadenopathy. You can have the gone complex or a calcified granuloma. Uh, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, those are good. Uh, but quite frequently when I was rambling a lot more, we find people admitted from an emergency room to, to F2 with, with, with x-rays that suggested the possibility of tuberculosis. I, I think it's fairly common here in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. oh, that's what I thought. And, uh, and, and they sit up in the, a semi-private room, coughing over people and everything like that, and, you know, and we try to find a, a bed for them to put them in isolation, and you get pushed back from F6 and this and the other. And these people obviously had need to be ruled out of the purposes. And uh, so they, they always give you a little pushback on that. But according to the TB Society at, uh, in Lansing, we should be isolating 10 to 1. If you're not isolating 10 to 1, you're not isolating enough, according to them. They have somehow never come up with that formula. So if you may have a suspicion of tuberculosis, you should be put in isolation. And one out of 10 of those should at least be positive or somewhere there or not. So maybe, well, all if you don't mind. So maybe you can clarify for me, because having been in that situation, I think it's, at least what I was told from the ID standpoint, it's obviously chest x-ray findings, and they usually come in with a cough or something suggestive of. But you really have to take the thorough history to see if yes, they I have the risk factors for it, because yeah. just an isolated x-ray finding. I don't mean just x-ray findings, okay. but certainly. Sorry, go ahead, Allah. Yeah, I just have a question for the uh, about so when you have X-ray findings, clinical scenarios of just the TB with positive background and negative cultures, negative sputum, negative infused sputum, direct and cultured after 30 days or 45 days, actually. How often 
do we treat for ultra mega TB? The studies that I found were up to about 20% of people with presumed TB are, will never culture positive. So if the suspicion is high and they have associated findings in, in the relative scenario in the relative scenario that they are a plausible risk for having TB, you should treat based on clinical suspicion. But I think some of the docs that treat TB more than I have may have better information. And then you follow up, right? So you follow up and you treat them and you follow up in like two months and your the reflection is they repeat as we don't want to do. And if their imaging is getting better and they're feeling better with the treatment mm -hmm. of TB and just telling yourself that this would this was TB, then you think getting better, they're feeling better. Just like the you cuts are negative. Um, the pleural uh, effusion, is the TB one, so the, I think this is one of the gold standard for the gold standard for diagnosing it is it's a pleural biopsy, right? It's out of an EDA. The gold like standard is culture but, positive from what I found. Okay. Because there's still a false negative. It's so, yeah, exactly. So, it's like less than 50%. It's, it's low, and I'll be honest, I didn't go through a lot of other articles. I really included that because I was interested because we come across it. Um, but it, the absolute gold standard that I was able to come across was, was culture. It's biopsy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think the rate of culture positivity is probably low. Mm-hmm. Biopsy. 